Hi, listeners, and welcome to No Priors. Today, we're here with Eric and Kareem, the co-founders of Ramp, one of the fastest growing fintech companies of all time. We'll talk about the path to self-driving money, how they make AI and systems thinking fundamental to every part of Ramp, and why using AI in financial services is not as risky as people might think. Welcome, Eric and Kareem. Well, today we're super excited to have Eric and Kareem from Ramp joining us. So thank you so much for coming. Thanks for having us. It's great to see you both. Maybe you could tell us all about the origins of Ramp, how y'all got started, what you're focused on today, what roles you play at the company. Ramp in some ways is sort of the sequel or, or taking our last business forward. We, we'd started about a decade ago at a business called Paribus. Uh, back in 2015, I, I would probably reframe it now as, a, as an AI agent company. Essentially what it did is, let's say you bought something from Amazon, Best Buy, Macy's, whatever. Every store would guarantee that the next week the TV went on sale, you could get the difference back if you asked. So we built it was an email app. We um, scanned your inbox for receipts. We detected what you bought. And if you were eligible for a price drop refund, we wrote an email as you sent, you know, or chatted with the store as you to ask for the difference. They would respond, give you the difference, and we charged a cut. As we launched this, within a year, we had almost a million members, and uh, we had a life sharing offer from Capital One to buy the company. So we were thinking a lot about, first, how do you turn data into savings? Um, uh, we didn't know the first thing about credit cards. We learned it. We saw it was a great, large industry, very profitable, but deeply misaligned with customers. Um, people were obsessing over the question of how do you get people to spend more money or more points, and we got very interested in the question of, you know, if you actually listen to people, they don't want points or cash back, they actually want more in their bank account. The best way to do it is not get people to spend, we get people to not put differently, like not spending $100 in the first place is 100 times better than getting a dollar or 1% back on it. And so we got obsessed of, wow, what if you put Paribus in a card? What if you had, you know, a card and software that was designed to get people to spend less in the first place, that seems more aligned with customers, a different way to go to market and uh, fundamentally a better product. Um, and so back in March of 2019, we uh, incorporated the company. Uh, today, we're just shy of five and a half years old. And um, I, I would say a lot of what we're working towards today is, um, you know, this question of can you have, you know, self-driving money in an organization? Um, can you build um, really the primitives, you know, can if from one place issue cards, make payments of all kinds, manage approvals, even automate accounting. Um, but really what we're doing is when you have the right primitives, abstracting away all the tedium of you don't need to add receipts to a transaction. You tap a card, we pull the receipt from your email and you're done. You don't need to tag every transaction and how it should be booked in your uh, books and records. Uh, and so today, um, 25,000 businesses use it from um, small startups to Shopify to Boys and Girls Club of America to farms to anything in between. Um, and, um, you know, so that's how we got into it, what we do. And um, I'm, I'm the CEO and run a lot of the, um, you know, business functions, Kareem CTO, um, of course, technical, but also we can get into it um, overseas, even, um, you know, marketing other functions that we see think are becoming more technical. It's been an amazing run over um, five years. You know, a lot of the value you're talking about are, like, as you said, for organizations. And I remember talking to you guys when you were just getting started, you were like kind of discovering that there was all this value in businesses and how businesses spend instead of like your first company was more consumer oriented. Like, yeah. how did you decide to like make that shift and like, how, you know, learning about that audience, investing in it? I'd say, I'd say a lot of the like really ideation phase of, of Ramp, we were... Uh, talking to a lot of our friends, people in, in our community, and it just so happens that a lot of them were either starting early stage companies or joining early stage companies. Um, and a lot of the, the, the problems that we're facing at a larger scale were some of the ones that we were trying to solve for consumers first. Um, and the, the, the funny thing with, with uh, businesses is the, the, the better they got and the larger they got, the actually the more wasteful they would get and the less they would know about their... Yeah. They're spent. Tougher investors, yeah. It's like not only is it like a more interesting uh, uh, and in, in some cases like bigger problem to solve, it just like scales with success in, in some ways. So like the, the, the better companies were even more interesting opportunities for us. So uh, we, we went after that. And, and there was, I'd say like another realization we had early um, around, uh, like you look at the user experiences of, of different products out there and the ones we use as consumers on a day-to-day, -day, like they obsess over every single interaction every single flow like instagram's amazing robin hood did that very very well for trading stocks and investing and then those same people who use these apps in their daily lives show up at work and are expected to use tools that were built in the 80s and are incredibly slow and very clunky and there just wasn't a good feedback loop between 
like what the people wanted to use at, 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 at work and what they what they were they were using in their daily lives and we saw an opportunity to really bring a lot of consumer thinking around like UI UX obsession to com complicated business problems. Where did the first um, savings thesis come from? Like what you know, if if the idea is like spend less money and have less yeah. waste for consumers on like there's a price change like you go deal with this that sounds amazing like what was the first hook for a ramp? First was just a basic business problem of, I think most startups, their biggest battle is people not giving a shit. <laughs> like you work on so hard on the software and there's a million other pieces, you know, apps, tools, cards, how are you going to stand out? And we realized there was this gap in the market. Most of the, the credit card ecosystem was really designed around kind of ego and excess and use my card and you get lounge access and points and you can fly to exotic places. And it just was so different from what business owners and CFOs and people I know who are trying to build enduring, profitable businesses. So it felt very at odds. And so some of it was just, um, we thought there was a, a large unmet need. That's interesting. So just like the cultural premise of yes. the card was very different. Yeah. It's not like, uh, let's say like Amex yeah. fancy for the individual. The luxury that Amex, I believe, was was really owning and building was almost like an 80s conception of like luxury of like, you have like lounge access and it's covered in mahogany and it's super cool. And like luxury in the 2020s is, you know, I can go to a yoga class at 2 p.m. because I have the time around a green juice because I'm healthy. And and it was just very different. And I think the thing that was so I think people were missing is uh, time. Um, people had um, very little time. And so we tried to focus on not just saving money, but saving time and, and, and to kind of zoom into where you know, some of our first products was you'd see these great early stage startups, really promising, starting to build traction. And then you say, great, um, uh, show me what you're spending on. And you discover they're spending on like four sets of project management software or like five BI tools that do the same thing. Cause someone tried it. Someone passed the card to someone else. The finance person is like, get me the receipts. Doesn't ask the question of what are these, these things. And so some of the first insights was, so you'd say, well, um, show us your um, credit card statement. We'll show you all the duplicative software, all the redundant spend. And um, by the way, we just, you know, we helped you cut your spend by 2% per year. Um, maybe you should use our card. We'll help you do that all the time. Um, and so it was very simple um, was the, the mechanisms. It was, it was cutting out redundant spend and it was automating processes. Um, um, and I think it's expanded, but sort of these same principles of, you know, if the, the one thing people don't have is an hour, you know, on Fridays to spend with their family because they're doing expense reports, because they're tagging transactions in tedious report, how can we give that back to them? Um, how can we design pro uh, products that will automate the tedious um, to, I would argue, gives people the, the new luxury of time. A lot of people say that with this wave of generative AI, there's new things you can automate or change. And you all have been very big adopters of the technology internally in all sorts of different ways. You tell us a little bit more about how you're starting to use it, both for internal purposes. I yeah. mean, you mentioned marketing is now a technical yeah. function, which is amazing. How you're starting to implement it for customers or where does that matter? How you think about that as a regulated entity? So I would just love to hear how you started thinking about using AI and then what that's led into for you all. A hundred percent. I mean, w w one of the early uh, uh, really thesis of, of Ramp is if we really want to help you uh, save time and money, we need context, right? So one of the things we obsessed uh, uh, a, a lot over in the early days is we have some amount of information from the card statement. We have more information from the things that we see in your inbox. We can get even more information if we're connected, we're connected to your ERP. And you get to a point where like, okay, there's a lot of it. It's very unstructured. How do you structure it and really help companies build and automate the workflows. So, and that's kind of how a lot of the like internal ways that AI uh, shows up in our product really work. And that like, they tend to, like we really focus on the job to be done. So in, like you wanna close your books and there are different workflows that are part of this. And uh, we're able to work on them a lot faster and really customize them without having to think about every company individually, because we're able to just like apply a high level generic like, um, AI algo with some constraints and, and just make sure that those repetitive tasks uh, become a lot faster. Uh, so there's a lot of that that we do also on uh, helping you figure out uh, what bills to pay and when. There's often a right answer, right? You want to pay the bill at the most optimal time. Generally, that's the last day that it's due. In some cases, it might be earlier because you get a discount. And those are all the things that, that have a right answer. Uh, they take a little bit of thinking, but there's generally a way to 
uh, evaluate and test what the right answer is. So a lot of great applications in in helping people just like get get peace of mind on those decisions and not have to like many look at every single invoice. Uh, there are many cases where uh, financial operators stress over fraud, right? And the way that they check for uh, fraud is they'll have to uh, essentially look at different data sources and make sure that they match. That's also something that we could do like so much easier with AI. Like let's make sure that we have three-way matching and we can match your purchase order to your invoice uh, to the goods that were actually delivered. Uh, so there, there's many of them, but the one decision that we've made early is financial professionals care about the job being done uh, and they care about the observability and having control um, and a lot more than they care. Like they don't actually care that much if they're using AI, they just want it to be like fast and accurate. The AI function is something that applies a lot of sort of thought and reasoning to different aspects yeah. of what build to pay or other aspects of the business. And then my sense is, well, you're also doing some really creative things internally. Yeah. Yes. With AI. Can you tell us a little fun. bit more about how that's impacting functions across the, the company today? A hundred percent. I mean, so a lot of people know outside in, sort of said so Ramp's one of the fastest growing fintech of all time, one of the fastest growing software companies. Some of this is good positioning and timing in a good market. Some of this is like very, very early adoption of, of AI in, into augmenting the capabilities of uh, our sales team, of our marketing teams, of our underwriting teams, all the, all the way throughout. And I'll, I'll, I'll zoom in on, on one. I think that there's a lot of startups now starting to think about um, you know, AI sales and automations. And you know, in, in, internally, years ago, we had built a, a functionally outbound automation team. Uh, and what we had noticed is, and this is back years ago, we had very little resources, but there was one sales rep who was incredible. You know, He could go out and book far more meetings than anyone else. And we were trying to figure out, we're like, wow, if only we had two of him, <laughs> this would be great, or three. And, and we want to understand like, what is making this person so productive? Uh, and so one of the unusual things we did is we uh, you know, had a few engineers sit down with him and just track what he did during the day. And he'd follow kind of his calendar and turn to wake up in the morning and there'd be a new set of companies that raised funds or the people that he was in touch with who moved companies or all kinds of stuff. And he would, he would form his own list. Then he would go and try to guess at people's email. Uh, then he would try to go and send different copy out. And it turns out that actually, so he had the right mechanism, but there was lots of manual steps. And so before jumping straight to, I'm going to hire a AI salesperson agent, we said, let's give him an Iron Man suit. Let's, uh, let's go and, and the things that he's looking at, let's go and pull those signals so the lead list is done for him. Um, let's pull those emails. He doesn't actually have to guess at it. Um, let's run some A-B tests. Um, he can send things, but use kind of base templates and figure out what's actually working better or not. And the net effect is you kind of flash forward to today, um, the number of meetings that um, sales development reps at Ramp are able to book each month on their quota is multiples of any of our next closest competitors. And so it translates into a, a radically higher sales efficiency um, and the ability just to invest um, more heavily in, in scaling. And so that's part of been, um, how we've been able to continue to scale. Um, you see similar aspects and, and Kareem can go deeper into how we're looking at it and aspects of marketing. But, you know, I think a lot of great marketing is, is thinking about, you know, a CDP, customer data platform, and, and understanding who people are, what's the intent, and how do you generate great creative. In the world of AI that we live in now, the cost of creating creative art has never been lower in human history. You can create amazing visuals, images, text, copy, um, uh, you name it. Uh, and so a lot of what we try to do is sort of decompose what the function is and how do we use uh, the radical improvements of foundation model capabilities connected to data. Well, one question on this, like how do you, what do you think makes Ramp different in that, I mean, maybe there's many things here, but um, you know, most organizations, like the idea of resourcing, understanding yeah. the SDR function with engineers and then executing against tooling for them is just like, it's, it's not gonna happen. Right. You know, division of the organization. We only have so many engineers. Engineers are not interested. Like what makes that work for you guys across the org? Two or three things. First, engineers are actually interested in and gold against business problems. <laughs> like yeah. actually drive a PL, which is like very different. Often in, in many, especially like traditional companies, this is one of the things that felt like torture at Capital One of engineering and technology was a cost center. Mm -hmm. It was only an L, there was no P, there was no profit. And so it was just a question of where are costs and how can we rip things out, out, not how can we grow revenue and profit. And that's fundamentally different from, from the get-go. Uh, I think it's important for any 
you know, business to, to think about. I think going deeper, a, a lot of what people think about is how do we minimize costs? One of the inherent questions that we're asking is, you know, time is money. Um, where are you spending your time? If you kind of think back to the salesperson example, really what we were most interested in is not how many dollars were we spending, but where were the hours going and where could we automate, which I think is a great framework to think about um, kind of the use of, of AI, which I think its best use case today is productivity. Uh, and so it shouldn't just be, hey, where is cost and how to use AI to rip out costs. It should be how do you augment and have every hour go a lot further, I think is just some of the different framing. But there, you should add a couple more. A lot of it also like goes to like the types of people we, we hire as well in the first place. I think a lot of organizations will have maybe a, a list of 10 competencies and skill sets and post the interview, you'll get in a room and it's like, well, this person checks eight boxes, but doesn't really check these two. And there are two very different things that we do is one, uh, we really care about spikes uh, a lot. And we also care about uh, people who wanna, I don't know, are like very entrepreneurial and wanna do things their own way and are kind of contrarian to some extent. And when you hire people like that, which again, some organizations won't hire because, well, I don't know if that person wants to stay here forever, or I don't know if that person fits the Capital One mold, to use Capital One as an example, or really, really any other company. Uh, I think at Ramp, I really, I mean, from the beginning, I've always seen it as my job to just get like really raw talent that is incredibly ambitious. And it is my job to keep them interested and to keep the company interesting for them to continuously see uh, these challenges and, and be attracted to them. So there, there are definitely different types of uh, engineers that we hire in most companies. It's interesting because when I look at the companies that I feel that have uh, done some of the most interesting things over time or have been capital efficient or whatever it is, they often end up focusing on certain forms of automation early that other people don't consider. So early Google is that way, actually. The online sales and operation teams, if you just ex extrapolated out how big it would be, by the time the company was 10,000 people, they would have had to add, I don't know, it was 50 or 100,000 people to just follow, to deal with that volume. So they started building internal tooling early for it. Yep. So I think it's kind of a common theme for companies that are very thoughtful about this. How did you all think about what to build versus buy? Have you ever thought about actually spinning this out or offering it as a product? Or yeah. Customers, I'm sort of curious how you think about those dimensions of this. So I, I think that question gets asked a lot and like you generally get with a nuanced, like it depends answer, which sure. is generally right. But the one thing that doesn't get talked about is um, we can kind of assess generally whether if you decide to build, if you've done a good job building or a bad job building, it's very hard to assess when you, do, uh, when you decide to buy, whether you did a, a good job buying or, or not buying. And it's not something that really comes up in uh, say, I don't know, a performance review or in the way like people get evaluated internally, which is kind of crazy when you think about it. Like we talk about people get, being great in organizations because they're great at hiring and recruiting. And, but you never hear anyone talk about, oh, this person like picks the right vendors is yeah, really good I at Yeah, I never measured up procurement. That's super yeah. interesting. Yeah. And that is one like skill set that we, we, like, we did focus on very early. The way we pick uh, the right vendors is almost like essentially interviewing them. We primarily like to talk to the engineering teams. Uh, we care a lot about the slope and the rate at which they're progressing as opposed to whether they have gaps today or, or not. Mm -hmm. And that has served us in incredibly well. Out of curiosity, like why not? Um, and I know it's a very different type of business, so that may be the answer. But why don't you just start offering some of these services to your customers to use as SaaS products? In other words, there's this whole wave of AI happening right now. There's yeah, a thousand yeah. companies doing what you mentioned at CR Automation. The marketing stuff is a little bit behind, but we're trying to talk about it. Like you're basically um, dog fooding products. They could actually have real scale, yeah. potentially in the same customer segment that you have. I'm just curious, like why not go and offer this for the world? Especially when like there are a lot of engineering teams out there who um, they experience these pumps pretty abstractly, yeah. right? Yes. Like they've never, you know, been attached to an SDR for days on end, like yes. you described. So there are, there are real advantages here. I think it's a fair question. I, I would say like the, so we, hire us. I know it's like, hold on, it's like, we need a services. strategy function, help <laughs> yeah, us do that. Yes. No, it's, I want to come back in a week and be like, you were right. No, I mean, I'll, I'll, I would say the simplistic answer is just simplicity in the sale. Like everything we do is centered around saving you money and time for, for finance organizations. And when you sort of think about like the, the order in which we've done things, it's, you know, expense and cards instead of needing two apps to buy one thing and Amex and, you know, a concur. 
You just tap a ramp card and your expense report does itself. Then you add in bill payments and you add in procurement and travel. And so it's more products that, that continue to help the same economic buyer. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think there's a lot of friction um, from a go-to-market perspective when you're selling to different buyer groups uh, with inside of organization. And so I would say the overly simplistic answer has been probably we just haven't thought deeply enough about it. And maybe maybe we should. I I, I do think what you were saying, though, is, is, is actually, a, I think, worth emphasizing though, like at a lot of companies, I think everyone's heard the saying of, you know, no one gets fired for hiring IBM. Like I, I kind of, should be. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I kind of think at ramp, you might get fired for picking IBM, right? Like you actually want to pick vendors yeah. that, um, not based off of just, they have every checkbox, but they are properly sloped and they're going to advance. And if you play this out in a year or two, they are going to give your organization a fundamental advantage. Um, and kind of, you think about just what AI can do of, of augmenting systems, like actually building great pipelines, rails by which to operate is, is I think never been more important. If you play it forward a little bit more, right? Like if you have these like AI salespeople, AI finance people, AI, and it, it how do you determine whether you pick the right one or not? Uh, if you're not, if you're like replacing a lot of functions that you would have hired a, like some people for with uh, with like essentially an an, an, an AI professional, uh, I don't think we have the frameworks or the tools to do that today. And also, how do you refresh that over time, right? Because often once you buy something, there's this incumbency there's no bias. Yeah, you just keep going with it, so you don't actually know what's in the market usually as well. One, one question on this, because like uh, valuing time and yeah. productivity feels like such a core thing for yeah. RAMP. Uh, I've, you know, a lot has too, but been on the board of companies that sell productivity in some way. And increasingly, AI companies are selling like productivity as part of the, of the value. Um, it's kind of hard, right? I would make an argument that a lot of organizations don't necessarily value productivity versus like of their people versus direct top or bottom line. And so I'm, I'm curious, like, like how you guys think about it internally, how you sell productivity to your customers. We get classified a lot as a fintech company and like we're fine to, to be in that box. I actually think we're a productivity company. I agree. <laughs> like primarily what we're selling people is time. It's expense reports that do themselves. It's books that, that do themselves, keep it clean or more accurate. Um, it's a procurement pro like process that actually is just upload the contracts. We get the approvals. We show if there's better prices available and you just have to worry about the thing you want to buy versus just jamming it through your organization. Uh, and I, I think it is productivity. Um, and, and what I would say is some of what helps us is in the finance organization, uh, think of it from their perspective, uh, unlike R and D and the fancy parts of it, their G and A and CEOs say G and A has to go down every year. <laughs> you cannot hire more people. And so they're asked to do the job of multiple finance teams as the companies get bigger without new resources. And we allow them to do that. Um, we sort of create this, the scale leverage for them to, to, to do that is, is some of the way that we talk about it. It definitely helps to be a product that's free to try, that pays you to use it and shows you ways to cut out costs. Um, and I, I think what Kareem was saying, and is, it's funny, I think in 2024, we're almost like in this, uh, I think back to the 90s, you know, in the uh, early, probably in 97, 98, your stock went way up. If you said were whatever.com, it was really good. Then pets.com came out and it was a liability and it was really tough. And, you know, now you've got saying we're AI this, AI whatever product. Like we show not tell is a big part of what we do. Like we talk about automation, um, about increased accuracy because there's fewer processes that you need to go through. Um, AI is there, it's some of how we do it, but it's not the way that you, you, you will need with it. And so I, I guess it's all to say is like, we really focus on what is the outcome we're driving? How much will you save um, in terms of dollars? How many hours and are you getting uh, measured against this way? And can we really connect it, um, at least from a uh, positioning perspective? I mean, on, on your point of like, how does that show up in, in, in the sale? It's like a third order effect, but like we think that the companies that pick ramp will become more successful, will grow to, in some cases, become bigger. And as a result, like we will make more revenue. So it's I a love very it. Long... natural belief in your own customer. Base. But I mean, yeah. th there is, I mean, like we're starting to have like statistical significance <laughs> around things like, like underwriting risk and, and, awesome. and, yeah. and like risk of going bankrupt. And it's a lot lower for, for ramp than like anyone that we've seen out there. And we think, I'm sure some of it is like the types of, of customers that we attract. Uh, we think we have a brand that probably attracts people that do care about running a good business. 
Uh, so that helps, but also like the, the, the hope is that like, if you're on ramp, you're more likely to run a successful company. Okay. So you said you're a productivity company, not just a FinTech company, yes. but you are still a FinTech company. Yes. Uh, and you know, like I talked to a bunch of, um, like large customers, including like financial services, like traditional financial services players. And, uh, unfortunately I would say like a level of adoption and use cases that matter is still like marginal in most of these businesses. Um, and the, the, the reason I, you know, I'll hear from, let's say, large bank, Capital One type company without naming them is, uh, you know, it's too risky, right? Like uh, AI doesn't work at the level of reliability on the workflows and use cases that we care about and like something, something regulators, compliance is important. I know you guys believe that, but you know, you, I like I call Kareem and he's like, oh yeah, we're trying this and like, it's, you know, it's useful in this way or we're building something internally. Um, how do you guys figure out how to take that risk when you, you know, your processes, your product have to be like financial services, robust quality. I honestly don't think there's that, that much risk if you constrain the problem well, right? Cause at the end of the day, so like if you're, you're trying to figure out like how to use AI to help you categorize transactions, it's not an open-ended question. It was like, pick what, like make up categories. It's like, Hey, I know what the right categories are. Like, tell me which one of these could it be? And the way this could show up in the product is every single form is pre-filled and you can edit it if you need to. Every single list is pre-ordered. And in many cases, we can be better at asking you just a question that matters as opposed to like, a, like the, the same form that we ask you every time, right? So like you might be traveling and you went and got a lunch. We don't have information to know if this was a lunch with a candidate or a lunch with a customer. We can ask you just that question as opposed to uh, like, I don't know, that was how many people were at the event. Like that's something that we can, we can, we can answer because we may have access to your calendar and, and things of that nature. So it really constrains the problem uh, uh, a lot more. And like, you're not just like having AI do completely unconstrained work. So yeah, I kind of categorize risks in businesses or at least ones that take risk from these sorts of re uh, directions as known risks and, and, and known risks. Yeah. And you, you all have known risks. You know what you need to do. You know where things could go wrong. You can fix that. Mm -hmm. I think usually it's the unknown risks that cause real problems for uh, companies. And so, it's, you know, you have such a sweet spot in terms of what you build that I think that minimizes that, that sort of fear of something really bad happening, which is great. Well, and I think this is like this um, ability to define tasks that make sense and understand like performance against the task internally um, is actually, I, I think, like a, like a very strong competitive advantage in application of AI today. And on, and on the productivity point, it's like, we all, I think, can agree that like AI has gotten incredibly good at translation, right? Like you could, there's some areas where like, okay, you're translating English to code and those could improve, but like broad translation, it's pretty good. The one type of translation problem that we see ourselves solving all the time is like accounting finance speak to like business. Uh, it's generically bad at math too, right? Like yes. Yeah. Certain basic math just breaks, which often gets into financial related items. Fair enough. But like there, there's not, uh, I mean, there, there's, there's not a lot of that, that, that we have to do, frankly. So do you, can too. you, um, can you effectively, are, are you thinking of like fine tuning a model against certain accounting terms or doing, you know, like I'm sort of curious how you think about problem solving or is it just wait for future generations of models to come out or? We did spend some time fine tuning in many places. And then we very quickly found out that our time was worth way more. Uh, and that we should just like wait, wait for like other generations of model. What we've gotten really good at though is hardening our infrastructure so that we can easily switch when we need to, and we can quickly evaluate the different models on the, on, on the subtasks that we care about. Like I was asked this question by, by, by one of our investors recently, it was like with like the GP, GPT-40 mini, how, how has that changed things for us? He has it brought costs down and how are we thinking about it? And my answer is like, oh yeah, it's, it's already in production. And for like 90% of tasks that we're running, it's good enough. So that was a quick switch. And within a day, we can know very quickly like that. Yes, this is that good enough, and we have the right evals. What is um, lacking right now from the AI stack? Like, if you were waiting yeah. for one thing to happen, is there anything specific, or is there a specific functionality or capability, or just someplace where it tends to fail? I'd say like we we have been exploring using AI to help you in in uh, essentially like end to end na navigation of like the website or the app. And that that's really hard. It's a cool demo uh, yeah. like that I've seen. We'll, we'll link it in the podcast notes. Our app is changing so quickly and you need to figure out like where do you have like guidelines and constraints and where do you let it be a little bit more open-ended. Um, there is a fun one that I, I, I really like, although it's not like quite there in production. Um, 
And as Eric was mentioning earlier, like I'm really focused right now on like what uh, lessons learned from really engineering and using AI in our product can we apply to other job families and processes that we run. And one of those is we, we, we write a lot of copy. We send emails to our customers. And at most companies, there's some kind of process where like someone needs to review the email to make sure that it follows your brand guidelines, that it has a clear CTA. And those are things that like in engineering, you could, it's more deterministic. You could do that as part like a test suite that you run during your like CI CD flow. What if we could build something like that for the copy that we're sending out? And we are starting to, to, to iterate on this. It's like every single email that is going out for the first time, can you run it through like an AI review uh, that is a lot more close to instant and as deterministic as possible, although that's hard. There's definitely room for improvement there, but I would say the improvement is more around the interface and the knobs that you can use to tweak your model, because today it feels like the most common way is just like write different prompts and longer prompts, and like that's that's the main way that you can guide the models. Uh, I think Claude with artifacts, uh, it's something really, really different that, that, that I love, and it's maybe a new, um, I mean, it's a different interface. I mean, it's uh, really outputting a mini web app for you that you can tweak and, and, and change. And like, we, we are obsessing over like what the right interfaces are for, for us. Maybe if you zoom out from that um, idea of like, oh, like, well, we could have testing like we have in software engineering, but on copy totally. to uh, it's weird in general for um, a technology leader to own marketing, like, you know, project out several years, what does marketing look like? Uh, uh, well, the, the one thing that I think will remain for a very long time is, is having good taste. Uh, and uh, at, like, at the end of the day, like, if you are, even if you are working with AIs and, and machines, uh, someone needs to decide, like, is, is, is this good or not? And, and there's this element of taste that you're not going to be able to replace. But what if you could get like, the, the, the marketing teams and, and professionals to just really, really focus on that and remove a lot of the mundane, repetitive and that's really like what, what I'm like, obsessing about now is like, how do we give the people in our marketing more time to focus on the things that are true differentiators and not have to reinvent the wheel on uh, just really like processes that could be um, hardened and, and, and improved with, with AI. And it starts with, there are different job families within marketing, probably a lot more than there are in engineering. The skill sets are very disparate and very often they need to work together effectively. Those interfaces between different teams are not always uh, v very clear. So like the first uh, step for me is just really looking at, at uh, marketing as any other system. It has bottlenecks, it has things that you could run in parallel, it has dependencies. And I guess the first step is like trying to identify where those bottlenecks are and building systems that reduce those bottlenecks. Kareem's a systems architect refactoring the stack and being like, I'm going to redraw this step. API, actually. <laughs> That's the problem, not the AI. So I want to tell like a, I, I guess like an anecdote for, so one of the things that's also unusual about Ramp is we're based in New York. Um, very unusual for fast growing tech oriented company. And so we're on 23rd Street, but six blocks south of where, where we're located is um, uh, Andy Warhol's old um, studio, which was called The Factory. Wait, I think where Eric's going to go with this is he's implying that because they're in New York, they have taste. And yeah. that's, 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 the, that's the last oh remaining God. several people. There's people <laughs> way cooler than us in New York. Like, we, we don't get good credit. Uh, on a topic, it's, it's, it's actually, I think, an interesting microcosm of, I, I think, where brand studios go in the, in the future. So Andy Warhol is this very interesting figure in the art world, which typically take previous artists you needed if you wanted to paint the mona lisa you needed to develop unbelievable skill over decades in order to finally make the thing to sculpt something to create his big idea was i'm just going to print stuff and i'm going to get my production process so well known and so well focused that every day i'm going to pr print something out on silk screen use these commercial methods and what i'm going to obsess about is not how do i make the art at all I'm just going to obsess on what is striking. And if you kind of read interviews of, of what people would say at the time and what they did, it was this crazy place. They'd say every day something new um, was how they did. They, they created lots of net new stuff, um, created reality TV. They talked about the like, security guard, Augusto. He was making art too. And, and people would joke about him that he would do this thing called art by telephone. And it was unclear whether or not Andy Warhol even made the painting and he would like sign it or someone would sign it as him. And you know what? It didn't matter. It, they were all Warhols. And you look at the collection of what he did over the time, like there's no question, it was radically innovative. But 
you could tell it's a Warhol. There is some brand system going on. You can see it's distinctly him. There's a production and he abstracted all of the complexity of production so he could just focus on making the striking. And this was in the 60s and in the 70s. And you zoom out to now and it's like, gosh, like you can make anything. Like you can quite literally make your own version of the Mona Lisa. You can make music, you can make video. Um, it's only gonna get better. Um, and I, I think it's an interesting lens to think about what might marketing look like in the future. Taste is very hard to replace. You might be able to see like what do people click on um, or prefer, but you know, all the complexity, if you really design and think about how do we produce things, you can reduce down from where I think a lot of marketers and people making brand get really caught of it's both how do I create the environment by which I make the art and then I test it and I'm focusing on the ideas and you see I'm going to constrain all that just make striking interesting stuff and so I think one building in different places you, you think about different sorts of things but I think that's part of why is like when I think about I don't know started talking about this and I, I think when one of Kareem's I think unbelievable strength and superpowers is like, how do you create an environment by which you can create and give people leverage um, of any function? And I think marketing is this really interesting thing. It's one of the places that, um, you know, I think of most of the generative AI tools, a lot of it's around arts and poems and songs and, and music. And so I think it's a place people are really underestimating of the importance of what you can do to augment. How does that map against your marketing function today then? So I think, I think that's a really compelling vision of where things are going and how everything's evolving. I'm a little bit curious, just like how big is the team that you have right now focused on marketing? Has um, the use of AI or their technologies constrained how many people that you bring in? Does it give them enormous leverage? Is it you divide it in traditional like brand and digital and performance based marketing? And all, like, I'm just sort of curious, does it change the normal marketing department structure? Or is it roughly the same structure? We provide a lot of tooling. The structure that we have today is, is, is roughly the same. And we're like prim primarily focused on, on giving them more leverage. Um, I, I think what uh, we're, we're trying to do is like make sure that they're able to like match um, the speed at which uh, we want to like continue to build product. And I think a lot of companies, when faced with that, will tend to slow down. It's great. We're gonna stop mm -hmm. shipping every week or shipping every month. Instead, we're gonna do quarterly quarterly releases and yearly releases. And the problem with that is uh, you kind of like cap yourself. And generally, like you do that to give more. Uh, breathing uh, rooms or more to, to have more control over like the things you're putting out in the world. And the way we want to do that is by giving those teams more, more leverage and, and better tooling without compromising on speed. I do think the question you're asking is, is completely right though. Yeah. It's like, what, what should any modern organization and function look like? And, you know, I, I think we're uh, early midway. There's a lot of things that have actually been just like unbelievable in, in, in starting to take a technical lens to functions that are uh, sometimes underappreciated for how much technical work it takes to create great marketing, great sales, all, all of that. But I, I think the thing that is still hard for people to grok in some sense is, you know, if you have a great idea, you can, you can spin up tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of API calls and functionally have a team of a hundred doing some kind of task, and just the human mind doesn't work in that way. And so I, I think part of what we're spending a lot of time talking about is, is it a hard requirement where people need to think in systems and know how to build and use tools and thinking about whether it's a selection of vendors and, and great tools could be leveraged even in your own working environment. Um, how do you leverage your yourself and, and, and employ that as a, as a core thing we should be interviewing for everywhere? It's actually one of the areas at least I'm personally most excited about for AI. And in particular, if I look at the marketing use cases and I look at things like ads agencies, mm -hmm. where they do a lot of the work that you mentioned in terms of iterating on copy, iterating on the imagery, doing it by different format for, is it TikTok versus TV versus whatever, that is all very automatable with AI. And so I'm very excited about that area. It's just an area that's going to turn over because it's, con it's converting services into software to large scale and a lot of what you're talking about is different forms of that internally. I do think you need to have this trait like both in ICs and in leadership that you described of just like like being able to picture scalability in a very different way, right? Um, and I'll, I'll give you like one example. Um, you know, a friend a while back, he um, owned marketing at Stitch Fix. Stitch Fix, like, you know, they have a bunch of stylists, they do some data science, they like, you know, communicate with customers and, um, like most organizations, they've discovered video is a very effective marketing medium. Mm -hmm. 
And one of the things that a the marketing leader there did was say like, okay, well, the traditional thing to do is to pay this agency that Alad describes to like come up with something good and tasteful and on brand or whatever. And it's very expensive. The iteration cycle is a year. And he's like, well, I don't know. Like we have paid all these stylists. There's hundreds of them. And like, can we just like, we're not going to get the same level of quality. This is all pre gen AI, whatever. Right. But we're not going to get the same level of quality. What if we just give them direct manipulation and say, you all have to do video. It was a thousand times more effective. And it was like essentially free because the like talent was in the building, even if the quality was not, um, it wasn't like Coke ad, ad agency quality um, as output, right? But what you care about is the outcome. And I, I think one of the ways I think about the creative fields, and like including ones that are commercial, like marketing, it's yeah. a commercial creative field sure. is like, well, like, you know, if you, if you have people who think about scalability and you give people with taste um, an understanding of your business, like the ability to do direct manipulation, right? I make these videos myself or whatever, is probably going to be a lot more effective, but it breaks a lot of norms. That's exactly what we're doing, uh, honestly. And just making sure that you give, well, you can teach a, a system what your design brand is, and that system makes it very easy for anyone on the team to produce video if they want to, anyone on the team to draft a post of social content that is interesting. Uh, we start with what is what works really well, and then from there we iterate to make sure that it is on brand and can continue to improve and tell the like overarching story that 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 we want. I think it's a lot more restrictive to start with let's make something on brand and then let's make it work, and a lot more costly. Mm -hmm. um, so trying to like invert a little bit how uh, how we produce like good creatives and, and good content. Is there any one, one of the last questions or topics that we should ask you about or they want to make sure to... We talk about whether it's interesting. So one, one of the things that occasionally gets talked about in the office, I think it was like a year or something ago, the Wall Street Journal had this like big article that came out that said, you know, there's a million uh, fewer bookkeepers uh, over the past decade and it's a crisis. Um, and there's all these labor market problems. It's, it's wages haven't gone up. And so no one wants to be a bookkeeper and you're going to, you should expect inaccurate financials. And then someone, I think like a few months later, thought to ask the question of, you know, how many financial advisors and, you know, how many um, accountants are there has gone up by like a million. Uh, and I think it sort of speaks to the, the nature of jobs are, are changing. And um, I think sometimes when people ask, is, is it going to automate everything? I mean, our view is like it should definitely automate the, automate the tedious and monotonous. I don't think anyone should be spending any time, um, you know, chasing people for receipts or dealing with the anxiety of you're the receipt person. You see someone at the water cooler, you can't have a normal relationship. That should be like, that should be like, you know, an automated system. That should be where ramp is. And so I, I, I think... Um, if there's the jobs question, I, I tend to have a, a positive view. Um, I think there is a, a place for taste and higher level work that people can do. So you're, you're basically extrapolating out AI starts doing more and more things. And you're saying that means it frees people up from certain jobs that are just unpleasant, grindy, et cetera. It frees them up from a creator perspective because then suddenly you have centralized branding through a AI and therefore anybody can start creating copy or using it in different leverage ways. And so you view it as a very freeing set of technologies. I think so. And, and some of this is, for better or worse, just how I think about view the world tend, tend to be, you know, quite quite positive and, and excited. But I, I I think it's true. Like when I, I think it's necessary when, when you just look at the increase of the size of the company. You know, hundreds of years ago, you didn't see organizations with thousands of people. Now there's you know, million plus person organizations. And, and to build this, you, you needed the development of just how do we measure the receipts and expenses at all these franchises and factories and kind of the rise of bookkeeping as a profession. But now as, you know, um, uh, commerce is becoming digital in the first place um, and receipts are automated and your books are kept for you, you don't need so many people. And I, I think that's actually kind of a good thing because there's, um, so there was this funny set of research we we're doing internally and we wanted to figure out, um, so we have this function called strategic finance and we were interested just in like a benchmarking, how many people do strategic finance? And it's something like, depending on how you measure it, I think four to 9% of jobs in finance are strategic finance. Maybe this is where should we invest more, invest less? How do we, you know, um, rip out yield in, in the business? And, 
Um, I don't think this is finance people saying, you know, this is 91 to 96 percent to finance jobs are non-strategic, but uh, sometimes, sometimes it, it doesn't apply that. It doesn't <laughs> apply it. It's yeah. a it sort of feels that way. If you talk to strategic finance people, which you do, they're also like, well, like the part of my job that's the most strategic part is little, really yeah. small, actually. But it's it's real. Like I, I think part of what's made this work. One, I don't think it's possible to use Ramp today without. Um, AI is in your workflow in lots of places. You may or may not see it. It's there. Um, it's part of why Ramp is so easy and automated. But finance is somewhat unlike many other job functions and that people actually want automation. <laughs> GA has to go down as a percentage. There's a lot of tedious tasks. And what they want to be doing is saying, where should we be invest? Um, they want salespeople not looking up people's email addresses, but going and selling um, with people actually doing the high value thing. And so uh, I, I do think we're actually, if we do things right, on a long run of actually having people work towards um, much higher value uh, tasks and uses of their time versus just repeated things that can be automated. I, I think to make it work and to make it actualized, I think it's, I think there's something's got to give in terms of, you know, the foundation models are getting radically better. But, you know, I was with the CFO of a company this morning who walked me through, you know, over $10 billion in revenue, but quite literally hundreds of finance tools in order to keep their books, make payments, um, receive payments. It's like Byzantine. It's crazy. The more interesting question fewer people ask is how do we actually build like the pipes and the raw primitives, you know, the card payments, the build payments, um, the actual accounting, the low level operational task and the piping that you need so that when you overlay intelligence, you not just get insights of what you can do and just go manage it across hundred systems. It's, it's done. These card, you know, these vendors have been turned off. These ones have been turned on this contract. We're going to renegotiate it and it's all orchestrated. And so I, I think actually thinking about the primitives, the orchestration, the way it works together is a necessary act to get the best out of the intelligence that's coming. Um, so we can hopefully free people up, work on more interesting things, but we, we try to spend a lot of time thinking about that. Is it useful to ask like, what is exciting for ramp that people don't know about yet? Auto-generated auto podcast, because that was interesting. Oh yeah, yeah. There um, was. Uh, should we tell? Yeah, it's very meta. It's coming for. You know. Wait, no, 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 no. There's taste here. There, 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 yeah. Let's talk about this one because because okay. because it was fun and also very useful. But we have I mean, at this point we generate about like tens of thousands of hours of conversations with customers that we have all the time. You have lots of teams across the companies, from engineering to product to design to marketing, that would love to know like what our customers seeing, feeling, hearing, and it's very hard to do that because you can't listen to ten thousand hours. And we've had our like uh, internal applied AI team that was able to put together a very quick uh, process to essentially generate a five minute podcast of, uh, it could be Eric, it could be me, like asking questions of our customers. <laughs> and then you get like five minutes of like the most interesting things that happen with, with customers during the week. Uh, we want to take that a little bit further so that uh, anyone on the team could maybe zoom in a little bit on a sub-segment of customers, a particular persona, a particular topic. But we think it makes like coordination in the company a lot faster. So you don't have to like wait uh, for information to make its way to you. You could just like go get it at the source. Very it's very cool. interesting. My favorite thing is I, I think what the team wanted to show was, um, you know, it's the voice of the customer and we'd apply sentiment analysis to oh, tens yeah. of thousands of calls to find like the happiest moments. People saying like, I love Ramp. It saved me. This is it's a very thankless part of my job. Ramp helped all this. It was, it was sure. fantastic. So that was like the emotional, that was like the podcast that like we wanted to make. And so we, we send this out. It's great. LLMs have time for it in ways people don't. We start showing this to other founders and what every other founder starts asking us for is, What's the bad? I want the voice of the <laughs> angry customer. I want to know all the upset people. Because yeah. as companies get bigger, I, I think the big problem is no one wants to tell you bad news. Yeah, um, that's people funny. Go to, so it, you know, having a large language model help make sure you know what's going on. Um, unexpected fair. use case. Yeah, yeah. very cool. Thanks for the conversation, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Find us on Twitter at No Priors Pod. Subscribe to our YouTube channel if you want to see our faces. Follow the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. That way you get a new episode every week. And sign up for emails or find transcripts for every episode at no-priors.com.